Tonight we're having show and tell. In the second half of Jeremiah 1, the Lord gives Jeremiah three spiritual object lessons. First, he shows. In verses 11 and 12, it's an almond tree. In verses 13 to 16, it's a boiling pot. In verses 17 to 19, it's an iron pillar and a couple of other things. And then God tells the almond tree, the boiling pot, and the iron pillar mean that God's word will blossom forth, that his judgment will be poured out, and that his prophet will stand firm. First, then, the almond tree. How do you know for sure that winter is over and spring is on the way? I would be tempted to say when you see your first robin. The trouble is that I saw a robin in my birch tree during the first week of February this year. And given what has transpired since then, I have lost all confidence in robins as harbingers of spring. When I was growing up, the forsythia bush was the leading indicator of spring. When tiny yellow blossoms began to appear on the forsythia bushes by the side of our house, spring was definitely on its way, and I had an irresistible urge to get out my baseball glove. In Washington, D.C., it's cherry blossoms. And maybe it's cherry blossoms in Philadelphia, too, since I can see pink blossoms from my office window. In Oxford, it's daffodils. In Anathoth, where Jeremiah was born, it was almond blossoms. I don't know if they had an almond blossom festival in Anathoth, but they could have if they had wanted to. Even to this day, that region of Judea is a center for almond growing. And the almond tree is always the first to blossom in the spring. Already in January, the almond trees in Jeremiah's hometown were covered with white blossoms. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree. Very likely the branch was covered with white blossoms, or perhaps it had not yet blossomed, but its tiny buds were just beginning to appear. In any case, Jeremiah understood what the branch meant. It was the first sign of spring. The almond tree holds the promise of spring. That was the show. Verse 12 is the tell. The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The Lord teaches Jeremiah the spiritual significance of this almond branch, and he uses a play on words to do it. Isn't that wonderful? This is how God stoops to accommodate himself to our understanding. He speaks, he puns, so that we might understand. That word for watching is the Hebrew word shokade, It sounds an awful lot like the Hebrew for almond, shakade. In fact, those two words, shokade and shakade, are different forms of the same word, the word for waking or watching. The almond tree was the waking tree. It was the first tree to wake up after a long winter's nap. It was the watching tree. It was the tree that you watched to see that spring was on its way. The Lord shows Jeremiah this almond tree to teach him that he is wide awake. God is not asleep. He is not slumbering. He has not gone into hibernation. God is still on his watch. He is wide awake, watching and waiting. And what God is watching for is to make sure that everything he has promised comes to pass. He is watching to see that his word is fulfilled This is one of the main themes of the book of Jeremiah, what Douglas Rawlinson Jones calls the power and inescapability of the divine word moving inexorably towards fulfillment. God is going to do everything he has promised to do. He is bringing his plans to fruition. Even when it seems dormant, God's word is waiting to burst forth into flower. It is not dead. It is alive. Like the almond tree, it is starting to blossom. You can no more prevent God's promise from being fulfilled than you can keep the almond tree from blossoming. It's like the Lord said to Isaiah, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, 
so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That almond branch is full of solid hope and lasting joy for every Christian. It assures us that everything God has promised will come to pass. Every last one of God's very great and precious promises will be fulfilled. Let us begin to count the promises of God. There is the promise of redemption in Jesus Christ. There is the promise of forgiveness of sins. There is the promise of the free gift of the water of eternal life. There is the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit for you and for your children. There is the promise that you will be comforted when you mourn, that you will be shown mercy when you are merciful, that you will be filled with righteousness when you hunger and thirst after righteousness. There is the promise that God will never leave you nor forsake you. There is the promise that the pure in heart will see God. There is the promise that the people of God will be with God. There is the promise that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you in his Father's house and the promise that he will come back to take you there. There is the promise that Jesus is coming soon. There is the promise that the Lord Jesus Christ will transform your body to be like his glorious resurrection body. There is the promise of a crown of life, the promise of a share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. All of those promises are true. Every last one of them will be fulfilled. Some have already begun to blossom, like the almond blossoms in springtime. All of them will burst forth into full flower in the everlasting springtime of the paradise of God. Paul wrapped up all of these promises and many more besides, and he wrote, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Now what about words of judgment? Do they come to pass too? Does God fulfill his threats as well as his promises? Verse 13 is the show. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a boiling pot tilting away from the north. It's wonderful how the Lord uses the common things of this world to teach his prophet. First, an almond branch. Now, a pot, just a plain old cooking pot probably made of copper or iron. Jeremiah didn't know about gas and electric stoves, of course, so he must have seen this pot on an open fire. If you've ever been camping before, you know that it doesn't take long for water to boil on a campfire. You can imagine this pot resting on logs or coals and heating up to a rolling boil. The Hebrew doesn't actually say boiling, it says blown upon. In other words, the fire is being stoked, the flames are being fanned, and the embers are bursting back into flame. And as this pot resettles in the fire, it tips to one side. The boiling water bubbles over the side of the pot, and steam goes hissing up from the flames. That was the show. Here is the tell. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms. Trouble is brewing, you see, and it's not hard to tell which way the wind is blowing. That cauldron is tipping ominously away from the north. The Lord doesn't identify the northern peoples who will come spilling down towards Jerusalem but we can round up the usual suspects. Maybe it will be the Scythians from northern Asia, whom Herodotus mentions in his history as invaders. Maybe it will be the Assyrians, although they were on the wane in Jeremiah's day. Probably it will be the Babylonians, for they were then going from strength to strength. 
But the real point is that God himself is the one who is doing the judging. God is summoning the northern kingdoms, the scripture says. When the Babylonians come, they will be following God's marching orders. God is the one who will tip that boiling pot and pour it in Judah's direction. Judging sin is God's prerogative. He is the righteous judge who uproots and tears down nations, who destroys and overthrows kingdoms. As the Lord says in verse 16, I, I will pronounce my judgments on my people. Now see what it will be like for Jerusalem to be under the boiling pot of divine judgment. The northern kings will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. That gives us a hint that when judgment comes, Jerusalem will be a city under siege. Enemy armies will camp around her walls, waiting for the people of God to starve to death. And while they're at it, those northern peoples will have their way with the defenseless towns and villages in the surrounding countryside. But here's the real kicker. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. What a total humiliation. When an ancient king wanted to show his complete domination of a vanquished foe, he would set up his throne in the gates of their capital city. There is an ancient mural, for example, that shows Sennacherib sitting in the gates of Lachish, ruling as a judge over that city. Now consider how degrading that will be for the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city where the son of David is to sit upon his throne. In fact, it ought to be the throne of God himself. But when that boiling pot spills over Jerusalem, the Babylonian generals are going to park their thrones right smack in the middle of the city gates. This prophecy was fulfilled, of course. You can read about it in Jeremiah 39, where Nergal Sherezer of Samgar, Nebo Sarsakim, and Nergal Sherezer camp out in the middle gate of Jerusalem. Why would God allow his own people to experience such a defeat? And not just to allow it, God will actually bring this judgment to pass but he will do it with good reason. See what the scripture says. His people have rejected him. They have decided to follow after other gods. He holds a boiling pot over them because of their wickedness in forsaking him, in burning incense to other gods, and in worshiping what their hands have made. What a terrible thing for God's people to do. They have been burning incense to other gods, That's a blatant violation of the first commandment that God gave to Israel. You shall have no other gods before me. That word for burning incense can include offering sacrifices to other gods. So perhaps they have even tried to get atonement from other gods. They were also worshiping idols that they had fashioned out of their own hands. And that's a blatant violation of the second commandment that God gave to Israel. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. No wonder Judah and Benjamin found themselves under the boiling pot. These verses are a warning to everyone who does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You stand under the boiling pot of divine judgment. Don't do what the leaders of Jeremiah's day did. They took the view that God doesn't really punish sin. They decided that Jeremiah was just breathing idle threats, that Jerusalem would never be destroyed. Their attitude is summed up in Jeremiah 17, verse 15. Where is the word of the Lord, they said. That's a dangerous attitude to take if God is the God of the almond tree. That's a dangerous attitude to take if God is the God who brings his promises to fulfillment. His promises of judgment are as certain to be fulfilled as his promises of grace. Come to Christ for salvation. 
You are under the boiling pot, and yet there is still time for salvation in Christ. You see, if you do that, if you go to Christ for salvation, then you have the comfort of knowing that you are not under this boiling pot or any other. God has taken his wrath against us, and he has poured it out on Jesus Christ. We are saved from his wrath through Jesus Christ. That's true. But if you do know Christ, this passage still ought to make you think twice about bowing down before idols. The values of this world have a way of getting mixed in with the values of the kingdom of God. That's why we always need to be on our guard against worldliness in the church. The gods of self and sex and power and luxury and popularity and beauty are always clamoring for our attention. We need to turn a deaf ear to them if we're going to follow the only true God. We get more show and tell about how to do that, how to stand firm in God's purposes in verses 17 to 19. But first we need to see how God repeats Jeremiah's calling, the calling we heard a few weeks ago. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, whatever I command you, do not be terrified by them. Sometimes we need to have things like that repeated for us, especially if we are like Jeremiah was, a dubious candidate for Christian service. Get yourself ready. Brace yourself. Literally, God is telling Jeremiah to gird up his loins. Today we would tell Jeremiah to roll up his sleeves or to put on his sweats and lace up his sneakers. Back then, God told him to hike up his robe and tuck it into his belt so that he wouldn't trip over it when he started working or running or whatever he was going to do. Stand up and say to them, whatever I command you. We've heard that before. Back in verse 9, the Lord told Jeremiah that he was putting his words in Jeremiah's mouth. We've heard this before, too. Don't be terrified by them. God commands Jeremiah to be courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. Don't chicken out. But this time, God adds a warning. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. If you do panic... I'll give you something to panic about. If you lose your nerve, I'll shatter your nerve. If Jeremiah is afraid of mere human beings, God will put the fear of God into him. John Calvin's commentary on this verse bears repeating. This passage contains a useful doctrine from which we learn that strength shall never be wanting to God's servants while they derive courage from the conviction that God himself is the author of their calling. For God will then supply them with strength and courage invincible so as to render them formidable to the whole world. But if they be unhinged and timid and turn here and there and be influenced by the fear of men, God will render them base and contemptible and make them tremble at the least breath of air, and they shall be wholly broken down. That's a warning that Jesus Christ gives to all of his servants. This is what Jesus said in Mark 8. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. When we speak a word of testimony in behalf of Christ, even in the face of ridicule, we need to do it with spiritual courage. We need to say with Paul, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Now, if Jeremiah is going to be as bold as that, if we're going to be as bold as that, we're going to need the triple protection that Jeremiah gets in verse 18. How strong will Jeremiah be? God has made him a fortified city. Jeremiah will be a metropolis of a man. He will be like a city on a hill with high walls and strong towers defended by a mighty army. He will be the kind of man that 
Pharaoh Tutmos III was considered to be. This is what they said about him. A king is he, a hero, excellent fortress of his army, a wall of iron. Jeremiah is no military hero. He's just a man of the cloth, but he is to be just as strong. How strong? God has made him an iron pillar. Jeremiah will be a steel beam of a man. This word for pillar is the word for a prop, a foundation post that supports a building. Jeremiah will be a tower of strength. He will be like a flying buttress holding up the wall of a cathedral. He will support and uphold the people of God. How strong will Jeremiah be? God has made him a bronze wall. Jeremiah will be a metal bulwark of a man. Actually, there weren't any bronze walls in the ancient world, at least as far as I am aware. If you go to the British Museum in London, you can see bronze gates from Assyria. But they're only gates, and they're actually wooden gates overlain with bronze. They are strong gates. But imagine how strong they would be if they were bronze through and through. That's what Jeremiah will be like. Jeremiah is going to need that fortified city, iron pillar, bronze wall kind of strength. You can see why from what the Lord says at the end of verse 18. Jeremiah will have to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. That doesn't leave Jeremiah with many allies. In fact, come to think of it, it doesn't leave him with any allies. The kings of Judah will be against him. That's Josiah and Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. The officials of Judah will be against him. Those are all of the courtiers and advisors and civil servants of the kingdom. The people of the land will be against him. That's the citizenry, the regular folks, the rank and file, the working people of Judah and Benjamin. Even the priests of the temple will be against him. Even Jeremiah's colleagues in ministry will turn against God and against his true prophet. With friends like that, who needs enemies? The whole kingdom will be opposed to Jeremiah. They will fight against you, God says in verse 19. That's a word for military conflict. They will declare war on you, Jeremiah, the Lord is saying. They will attack you. They will ambush you. They will fight you at every turn. They will do battle against your ministry. When God told Jeremiah to gird up his loins, what he was really telling him to do was to don his combat fatigues. God's prophet has been appointed over nations and kingdoms to tear them down and build them up. So he is called to stand up to God's enemies. How can he do that? Remember, he doesn't know how to speak. He's just a youngster, as we saw in verse 6 a few weeks ago. How can any believer stand up against the enemies of God in a wicked world? Where does that kind of courage come from? It comes from the Lord. Jeremiah does not construct himself into a fortified city. He does not fashion himself into an iron pillar. He does not raise himself up as a bronze wall. No, the Lord says, today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall. God himself is the foreman for this construction project. And notice that he speaks to Jeremiah in the past tense. I have made you. It's a done deal. Right here at the beginning of his calling, God has equipped Jeremiah with the courage and strength he needs to finish his calling. The great Jewish scholar of the 12th century, Moses Maimonides, had this to say about the prophetic calling. We find prophets that did not leave off speaking to the people until they were slain. It is this divine influence that moves them, that does not allow them to rest in any way, though they might bring upon themselves great evils by their action. Thus, when Jeremiah was despised, 
Like other teachers and scholars of his age, he could not, though he desired it, withhold his prophecy or cease from reminding the people of the truths which they rejected. Jeremiah was indomitable. He was invincible. And it wasn't just his call that made him that way. It was God's protection. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. God didn't just make Jeremiah strong. He promised to stay at his side. He didn't just make Jeremiah strong. He promised to rescue him and to help him stand and not be overcome. And God kept those promises. Of course he did. He's the God of the almond tree, the God who watches to see that his word is fulfilled. Derek Kidner makes a striking point about the fulfillment of these promises. He observes that when you first read verse 18, it sounds like a wild exaggeration. How can one man be a fortified city and an iron pillar and a bronze wall? But Kidner points out that if you look at the whole career of Jeremiah, this verse turns out to be an understatement because Jeremiah held out longer in the Lord's service than the walls of that fortified city, Jerusalem. Jerusalem cracked and crumbled before Jeremiah did. He was like the Puritan described in John Gerees, the character of an old English Puritan. He was a man foursquare, immovable in all times, so that they who in the midst of many opinions have lost the view of the one true religion may return to him and find it there. Are you a four-square Christian? This command to stand firm in the day of spiritual battle is not just a command for Jeremiah. It is a command for every Christian. Jeremiah is a picture of the Christian who stands and is not overcome. Like Jeremiah, you are to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Like Jeremiah, you are to get ready for combat, putting on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Like Jeremiah, you are to gird up your loins, standing firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Is there anything in this world that is stronger than a believer who stands firm in the promises of God. The calling to be strong in the Lord is not just for super-Christians like Jeremiah. It's for every Christian, because every Christian faces spiritual danger. John Bunyan's pilgrim understood about that danger. I want to close this evening with the account from Pilgrim's Progress about the way that Christian answered the call of God. You remember, Christian answered the call of God and then embarked on a great journey to the celestial city. And on his way, he overtakes Mr. By Ends. Now, Mr. By Ends differs from what he calls Christians of the stricter sort. He's a fair weather believer. He can't be bothered with the demands of discipleship. He is not willing to hazard everything for God at least not if that's going to include any suffering or any opposition. We never strive against wind and tide, says Mr. By ends. We are always most zealous when religion goes in his silver slippers. Christian replies to Mr. By ends with words that apply to Jeremiah and to everyone who stands with Jesus Christ against the enemies of the gospel. If you will go with us, you must go against wind and tide. You must also own religion in his rags, as well as when in his silver slippers, and stand by him too when bound in irons. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise for the promise of springtime for the blossoms on the branch that remind us that all of your promises are true, that they will come to fruition, both in this life and in the life to come. We desire to be four square Christians, standing firm like Jeremiah did, even 
When all of the forces of this world seem to be opposed against us, we need the strength of the Holy Spirit to do that. We ask that you would make us strong, that you would go with us and rescue us, that you would help us stand so that we might not be overcome. In Jesus' name, amen.